recording? Okay. Um, good morning. Welcome to uh, Passive House Alliance of Vermont's presentation. This is the first presentation of the year. I don't know why this is. Get rid of that. Um, hey, there's Mark. Good morning, Mark. Hello. Welcome. Just about to get started. Help yourself to a seat. This is just my stuff. So um, I want to start off by saying um, that I hope you won't be disappointed, but after all the work and all of the money and all the time I've put in into fixing my house, I'm not going to hit the enter fit, not by a long shot. And there are reasons for that. Some of the reasons are the classic reasons that we all know about, the worst one being orientation. My house is a raised ranch. It's 42 feet long. It's 23, 23 feet wide and it faces with the gable end to the south. So I've got this really long axis looking east-west, which as passive house consultants know, is a pretty much a loss on window gains. Um, and there are more reasons that, for that, and I go into the reason at the end of it. Um, I'm, I'm at a bat, no, I don't want to change my, my, thank you very much. Thank you, Windows. Let me get this back up. Uh, F5. Okay, so um, basically the reason that I'm having this presentation is because uh, a couple of months ago uh, some members of the uh, Passive House Alliance were just wondering what was going on with my Passive House, my deep energy retrofit. I'm not even going to call it Passive House retrofit because it's not even a near Passive House, but I'll explain that. I'm getting at about an 80% reduction in heat usage in the house, um, and I started off with a house that was really bad. So we'll start off. Um, this is my house. Um, it's in the woods in the mountains out in Jericho uh, at about 700 feet above uh, sea level. Um, and as you can see, it has a, uh, a classic raised ranch, which means that the first floor is actually two feet smaller in width. And you see that there on the right. There's a bump out that's called a cantilever. Some people call it a gusset. Um, it gives you an extra number of square feet on the upper floor. It's negligible in the end and of course uh, is, uh, as far as building geometry, not a great idea. Um, my orientation is east-west, so right now we're looking at the south face with those two garage doors. Um, when I moved into the house, uh, this is what it looked like. Um, the uh, two garage doors, uh, you know, seven foot tall, nine foot wide, two of them, with absolutely no insulation in a heated garage. And what the heated garage means in this situation is that the it's an oil-based heating system, uh, hydronic, so the hot water would go out of the heating system into the garage to my daughter's room, back into the garage, up to my son's room, over to our bedroom, into the garage, and then to the bathroom. By the time it got to the bathroom, there was almost no heat left in this thing. And it, we must remember we're talking about Vermont with 7,200 heating degree days. Cold, damp climate. I was heating outside Vermont. The house was freezing even when the heating system was on full time. Especially the floors in the bedrooms, which are the ones that are on top of that tuck under garage. So um, another important thing is uh, it's a wooded lot, so I've, I've got really bad uh, solar insulation. Um, I have cut down most of those trees that you see in the background, but those are actually the north-facing trees, so they're not as important. Uh, I've done a lot of clearing to, to get more sun on the house um, and to protect it from windstorms, which we have here. I mean, blow big trees on top of houses, destroying them. Um, one of the basic things about a raised ranch is, as you see in this uh, picture over on the right bottom, is a raised ranch actually has a real basement that is not a basement. It's actually a walk-in half basement. And it's not considered a basement by Passfell standards because it has full windows and that the uh, slab is only about two to three feet below grade. Um, that does mean that I have a certain amount of, in this case, cinder block wall below grade, a little bit above grade, and then the walkout with no cinder block below the slab. I have a wonderful chimney that the people who built the house decided to put on the outside of the north face of the house, of course, 
which uh, means that I'm also, when I'm heating with wood, I'm heating the outside. And we bought the house for 240000 It was just reappraised at 250000 When I moved in, it had the original 1976 single-plane glass windows on 56% of the house. There was a bay window, which is 14% of the house, which had two angled single-pane windows and one double-glazed window, but the double-glazed window has maybe a quarter-inch spacing, so it's a really old double-glazed window. There are three other double-glazed sections, those three windows you see up there that are next to each other and the one next to that, those are the kitchen windows, that would be these windows and this window are all double-glazed, this is an awning window, the outside are casements and the inside is fixed, all once again with a quarter inch spacer, really not very thermally efficient and absolutely nothing in the, in the frame itself and uh, a double panel door, a uh, sliding door on the north face for the deck. The house came uh, with two by four walls filled with fiberglass and the above grade framing. Absolutely no insulation on the cinder block wall above or below grade, no slab insulation, and 12 inches of cellulose blown into the attic, which was something. Uh, the guy did something. I have this picture here because this is the, the person, the man I bought the house from, uh, a builder himself, um, decided he was going to finish the bottom floor to make it more valuable. And in order to do that, he took <clears throat> boards of uh, polyiso uh, foil back and stuck them here. This is the outside wall. This is the inside wall. There is about a six-inch air gap between the two doing absolutely nothing thermally, except for the little bit that it covers of the, the cinder block itself. It's doing a lot of convection, <laughs> says Enrique. Thank you very much. So um, just to finish the before retrofit, um, it has a, had a 30-year-old oil burner, um, which broke at the end of last heating season. And in order to get the financing for this, I had to buy an oil burner that I would only install in order to get the appraisal, which I did, used online. I got a $500 one for a grand. I was able to get someone to do parts and labor to install it, but hurt my feelings. Um, I have a wood stove. This is my wood stove insert. It's uh, also 20 years old. Um, has a blower fan to try to move some of the, um, the heat into the actuals, into the, um, great. Um, into the room, um, but it is atmospheric, which means it's pulling air out of the room to, to get the combustion air. Um, the first year I moved there, I decided, because I'd been living in the Netherlands and I was on the gas net, that I didn't want to use the wood because it's such a pain. I mean, you spend at least an hour a day at 10-minute intervals throughout the day working on that wood stove to keep your wood stove going. But after I found out that I was going through something on the order of 300 gallons a month to heat this house without wood, I quickly changed my mind and went back to heating with wood, even though it took me a lot of time. I was going through five to 700 gallons of oil and three cords of wood on a cold winter, like the winter in 2010. 2011, we had a rather mild one that was a little less. For ventilation, the house has no uh, uh, direct vent uh, in the kitchen. It's just a, a, um, a blower in the kitchen. And we have a Panasonic direct vent bathroom fan at 120 CFM in the bathroom, um, which my wife doesn't turn on for some reason. She's starting to get the idea when she started smelling the fact that it was getting moldy when she didn't um, do that. So I had a blower door test. I said, okay, let's find out where this house is at. And it came in at 1,806 CFM, which equates to 8.25 ACH50. Um, and just to re reiterate, uh, Vermont is climate zone 6, cold, humid, with 7,200 heat in three days a year. So what did I do? I move into this house. I haven't taken my, my passive house training yet. I have done energy work in the Netherlands before on buildings. So I know that I want double glazing. So I go to a local contractor who does renovations, and I say, okay, you're a local contractor. I don't know the American market. I just moved here after living in the Netherlands for 10 years. What's the best window you can get me? 
and he comes back with Anderson's super low E, double glazed, double hung, outside vinyl clad, so I'll never have to paint them windows. With a U value of 0.29, a whole R value of about 3.5, very low solar heat gain coefficient, and solar transmittance of 0.7. It cost me $12,000 to have these windows bought and installed. And I have never been more unhappy with a purchase in my life. I have windows that are going to last at least for the next 20 years that I'd much rather rip out and donate to Habitat for Humanity or some. Anyway, so replacing the windows was not a part of this project because I'd already replaced them. And I got to tell you, they finished installing these windows the week before I took the pass fast train. So <laughs> that tells you about timing, right? So what am I going to do here? I have to try to make this whole house much better, much tighter, and try to get the energy use down. I'd love to hit Enterfit, but I'll, I'll tell you why we're not going to get there unless the house burns down and I can rebuild it. First of all, I got to get rid of those garages. I, first of all, I, I don't use a garage. I can leave my cars outside. I don't mind scraping. I like the cold. I moved to Vermont. I like it snowy. It's fine for me to get up at 7 and scrape my car windows. I don't mind. My wife doesn't either. So we decided to make that conditioned space and get another 500 square foot of conditioned space in the house. I wanted to add 6 inch sweater of insulation of rigid foam around the outside. That would mean 6 inches of poly iso on the frame part of the house, 6 inches of EPS below grade, and I did a modified chainsaw retrofit to remove the thermal bridging on the upper, uh, where the, the ceiling joists come out to, to make the uh, uh, thermal bridge-free connection to the attic insulation. I, I have details on how I did that and why I call it a modified retrofit. I, had, I wanted to add um, seven and a quarter inch, which is the thickest rock wall that they give to the wall. Now, what I show, well, and I'll show you it more, the, the bump out where the cinder block wall meets the frame wall, there's a bump out, and usually when they when they um, do a retrofit or they try to condition that space, they make a shelf there, and I just don't like the shelf. I'll, I'll show you what I mean by that in a bit. So I want to just build a whole wall out, so I'll have a straight wall, and that gave me the opportunity to put lots of rock wall into the into the wall. I had to have the second floor ceiling air sealed, and I wanted to add as much cellulose as I could wrap the house in a membrane. I have a bay window, which I wanted to remove and replace with a picture window. I wanted to make the wood stove seal combustion, remove the oil furnace and replace it with an air-to-air -air heat pump, remove the direct van, uh, vent fan and replace it with a whole house HRV. And um, I wanted to model the house to see the size of the heating plant that I'd need and the HRV. And I had a budget of about $70,000, which does sound like a lot of money, and it is. It's 30% of the value of the house, but that is what retrofits call. So I'm not replacing the window. I already spent too much money. I don't have enough money to add windows. It would cost another $20,000 to put into sin, and we just decided to, to pass for now. Maybe if a rich relative dies, I'll go ahead and do that. So here it is. Here's the garage. I ripped the garage doors out. I went back down to the slab. I reinforced under the slab. And here's the wall that I had put in. Here's the guy framing it. And he's putting on, as you see, the, the classic sill seal, blue, worthless uh, air seal. Um, I didn't, I'm not using that for my air sealing, but um, I just wanted to let this guy do his job and not cause him too much trouble because I knew I was going to be using an exterior air membrane. Um, so this is what it looked like after. I'll just go back up and show you what it looked like before. There's the house before, and here's the house after. I have a door, a small window, and later on I put a large window in here. I decided I wasn't going to take six months to order super efficient windows for this particular part of the house, because why do that? The rest of the house has got leaky windows. So what I did is I let him just go and get another super low E Anderson window, but I made it, at least instead of double hung, I made it a casement window. And on the other side, I went to Marvin Windows here in Williston. They have something called the Boneyard, which is windows that have been ordered and not bought, or windows that were bought and then returned for some reason. They weren't the right color, the client didn't like the way they looked. And I was able to get uh, a, and you'll see it in one of the pictures, a four by, two by two awning window 
with a rather good uh, window in it, um, each window about two by two, um, that brings a lot of light into that area, which is going to be my mud room. So one of the ways I was able to save some money was to use second-hand insulation. I went to, called the Insulation Depot, a nice gentleman named Jeff there um, told me he didn't have the insulation I wanted, but there's a guy named John Gonzalez at Hickory Street Rentals in Oneonta, New York, who also repurposes insulation, and he had insulation. So I got all of the insulation for my retrofit for $3,900 delivered. That's with the delivery cost. So this is a great idea. First of all, I'm keeping this stuff out of a landfill. Otherwise, this would have gone directly into a landfill. And second of all, I'm saving 70% on the price of that insulation and not losing any kind of R value. This is all perfectly good. I ordered extra because I wasn't sure about the edges that might have needed to be cut. I didn't, so I ordered 15% more for cutoffs and things like that. I ended up having that 15% over, by the way, which is local. The guy who did the job for me, Jim Caleb, Jim Bradley from Caleb Construction, is going to buy from me to use in other projects. So what is a modified chain, retro, chain saw retrofit? Well, I've got a raised wrench. And if you, if you saw the roof here, you see that it is a 312 pitch. This is a very narrow roof. There's almost no room to get anything in there. And in the classic chainsaw retrofit, you would take this entire eave and cut the whole thing off, put in a, a, an addition on the top that would build out that you would add to, and um, make an entirely new roof out of it, adding insulation in between the members that you were putting down, and uh, coming down and filling that with insulation. I decided, since I've already got some insulation in there, and I've got a foot or so uh, above, and you can see that here, this is about seven or eight inches, actually. Um, this is the front, the, the sheathing on the house all the way up that if I just cut myself a notch here, I'd keep the, the structural integrity here of the roof and still get a thermal break on the ceiling joist, which is what I was looking for. These are site-built um, uh, trusses from 1976. <clears throat> so what I did is I figured I need seven inches because I'm adding six inches of insulation, give them a little extra room. There's the, the, the two by four I used as my, uh, my uh, temp template. There's the actual cutout afterwards. And you see, here we have the insulation. This is actually goes right into the, the attic. In order to give uh, my uh, insulation contractor something to spray against, I added a piece of OSB there at his request. So here's the actual mouth that I cut out that will allow the um, insulation to be put in there. Now, this is a nice picture because this shows my bay window. Good morning. Come on in. So my bay window. Let's talk about bay windows for just a second. I have some more pictures of it further down. But bay windows are horrible thermally. The top and the bottom are almost never insulated. They're places that rot. This thing was already rotting. It was almost falling out. I decided that as a part of the renovation, I was just going to rip it out. This is something I added later, so it's an addition. At first, I was like, okay, let me just try to keep it because my wife liked putting her plants in there. But we decided not to do that. Um, so I'm able to obtain a, a thermal break here between the uh, insulation that's going to actually go all the way up to the prop event there, but it's going to get notched here for the second bit so that I'm getting six inches of poly iso up to the prop event, and then this is all also be insulation. You can technically say that there is a thermal bridge there, but all that thermal bridge happens above the ceiling joist. So it's really, it go, this goes right into uh, cellulose at that point. So here's the inside, getting the air sealing done. Uh, they foamed the first 12 inches from the prop event back and up to the top in order to get air sealing and get a higher R value because there's a minimum R value of R40 in the roof in Vermont. R in the, seat in the roof. 42. Right, exactly. So in order to get that, he added an inch of, of uh, polyurethane, and then we filled it with insulation, with the uh, cellulose. Um, 
one of the things you get when you have a house that's already there is you get things like attached decks and attached front porches. This is my son sitting in a hole that he had just dug. He's not very happy right there, but he worked for almost an hour digging that hole and thought it would be cool to sit in it. Um, and um, you can see behind him and in front of him, these are two of the four four by four two, uh, posts that I put in to take the the uh, lateral, uh, I mean the vertical pressure of that um, ledger plate that I'm no longer using for my deck. I'm doing something else for the lateral forces, but this is for the vertical forces. And it allowed me to, to detach it. And there's my nephew, Zach, getting the cement ready going. Here are my friends, Ryan and Olaf, helping me put the new ledger plate up. And that's the gap that I got between the house and the deck. In order to allow more than enough room for the sixes of insulation, the men to work around there, and for the siding people to put siding back on. I did the same thing. This is beautiful. Look at this. The guy I bought the house from, there was a, a concrete form, classic prefab concrete staircase to the front door. He doesn't get rid of it. He builds on top of it. So I've got a rather nice porch there, but it's only sitting on top of this thing. And it's all sitting right against the house. So the, the, I've got to pull the deck off, and I've got to destroy that form or remove it or whatever. So I decided to destroy it, Hickel. And in you know my classic He-Man moment, I started off by drilling it, and then I just grabbed a big hammer and started smashing it, and ended up beating it to, to bits and uh, removing it, allowing me to get all of that away a lot for not only the adding of the insulation, but I also have to dig my, my, uh, my cinder block wall out. And that's the, the next bit. So down here you see my backhoe. I, um, I convinced my wife that I needed one. Um, it's a it's a it's a pull along backhoe, which means it's yeah. No, I'll, I'll, first of all, you, you guys are more than welcome to borrow my backhoe. It is a pull along, so it's a trailer. It's not motorized at all. It's just four wheels with a nine horsepower uh, Briggs and Stratton uh, uh, hydraulic pump on the back with you know, enough controls to move that arm out. Now, um, the convention, yeah. Well, I'll tell you that out afterwards. Um, so this is a great little machine. I was able to dig that entire 45 foot, four foot deep, four foot wide hole in four hours with that thing. It cost me $3,000. It's going to have a resale value. We looked into renting one of the smaller self-driven ones with those teeny little buckets on it. It was $150 a day to rent those things. And this has a 1.3 cubic foot bucket on it. Those things have like a half a cubic foot bucket on it. This is, this is what I told my wife. As a resale value, and you'd have to rent it anyway. So, um, the next thing that I did was I um, got in touch with uh, Joel uh, Baker over at Vermont uh, ICF, and I uh, was talking with uh, Ward Smith, who at the time was just finishing up doing the subgrade work on the Moortown Passive House. And I said, okay, I'm adding this EPS. How do I attach it? and how do I waterproof it? And the answer was you attach it with screws into the uh, chink between the, the cinder blocks and on the first course and the second course you glue on. The first course you also glue on with the polyurethane EPS foam but in order to make sure it's really up there you want to screw that in. So that's what I did. I have lots of pictures showing various stages of this but I didn't want to bore you with all of them. Basically this goes from the top of the footing, and then I've got a six-inch bump out under the footing. The material you see on there is called Soprima. It's a bituminous um, uh, peel and stick uh, membrane with a kind of a vinylish outside that is waterproofing. And I did that from below where I'm putting my perimeter drain all the way up to about three inches below where grade is going to come. And that that works very well. Is there a reason why you use XPS? 
<laughs> EPS. Yes, there, is, there are two reasons I didn't use it. First of all, I don't like XPS. It's got a very high embodied energy. It's got a very high global warming impact. Second of all, the most recent data shows that XPS is an, well, we know XPS is an open cell foam and EPS is a closed cell foam. XPS is replacing the air in it and the blowing agent in it with water at a faster rate than EPS is because of that um, effect. There was a paper that was put out about a year ago by the technical committee about use of foams and subgrade foams, and that was one of the findings, was that XPS, we don't like it because it's high embodied energy, high global warming impact. But they're the exact same chemical. They're the exact same chemical, but one of them is open-celled and one of them is closed-celled. And open-celled, once you break that outside uh, barrier, you just have open vacuoles that can take water in. Um, once it's got a waterproofing, they should be the same. But um, that was that was my reasoning. The reason there's XPS, actually, I have some XPS over here. That was because um, at the time I was just going to Home Depot and buying stuff, and the only thing that was in thick enough. Uh, I mean, I didn't want to get 15 three-quarter inch yeah. layers, which is what they sell. You can't get anything thicker than that. Um, yeah. Yeah. Whereas EPS, once you soak it, it dries up faster than both as XPS or polyester. Yeah. Also, that, I read that. I did read that report on the XPS and EPS. So the XPS and how it performed over time. Yeah. That. Although it was written by the XPS industry, not by it wasn't an independent. No. But, no. You know, it was a study by the XPS. But it was amazing that after 15 years, it stopped underground without. Yeah, the the uh, the one of the findings of that though was that the R value was decreasing over time, um, and that's because as soon as it's got water in it, it has the the thermal conductivity of water instead of the thermal conductivity of a gas. What uh, was that study again? That, it's on the website. It's a technical uh, review on the Pat, Pat and the FIAS website. Um, yeah. I did it from, from the bottom of the footing insulation because I bumped the footing out as well. With the six inches that I put on the, the cinder block, I added to the footing as well. So that's what that bump is. You see that six inch bump on the bottom. That's the footing coming out. And I went all the way down to just under where my perimeter drain was going to be sitting up. I wasn't going to go down too far because I'm expecting my perimeter drain to actually get rid of that water. So you made a perimeter drain. Yeah, that's the next picture. This picture shows the perimeter drain being put in with the, the clean-out, which is something I also learned from Ward Smith. He put clean-outs in the cor far corner away from where it drains out. If, uh, you know, you can just put a hose in there and wash it out if you think that it's not performing well, if you're not seeing water coming out of it. Do you think anything for insects on the phone? Yeah, I, I'll, I, I didn't show it in this presentation. There are bait, there, uh, Green Building Advisor has a great bit on what do you do to the outside of your phone. Um, and there were basically five things, and one of them was um, an EFIS application. Uh, uh, one of them was the uh, a parge. You put it on, you parge it with a, a cementaceous or a acrylic-based cementaceous thing. What I'm doing on this is at Home Depot, they have these five-foot-wide, three-foot-high um, cement boards that... Um, have an anti-mold because they're supposed to be used in bathrooms and anti-fungus and fungicide and I'm gluing that to this. Um, I did it before uh, on the south face um, while well, when I had the person coming to do the appraisal I didn't want the XPS just showing and there are seams but the seams are nice. Mm -hmm. It has a nice look to it and that stuff is going to last as long as any parge would. Mm -hmm. um, and the other thing that Green Building Advisor said is you can use pressure treated lumber. Um, it can be anything. You just want to make a barrier to keep the bugs out of it. Um, fascinating. Um, when I was pulling the siding off of the house, it was January, and underneath the Tyvek, there were colonies of cluster flies and ladybugs still alive, which told me that my house was leaking so much heat that I was able to warm up that little space and keep those things alive. 
not next year. <laughs> They're not getting free heat from me. Yeah, thank you for the lady bugs. Yeah, very, I, I, I gladly do for the ladybugs, but the cluster flies I have no, no heart for. So, um, so here's the perimeter drain. I, the perimeter drain that I dug up what was the old-fashioned um, uh, corrugated tubing with the holes on all sides. Most of it was clogged full with fill because the house has got fill around it, just a sandy kind of a dirt. And I decided I, I was going to just replace the whole thing. I got it open. Why not? Um, the only thing I didn't do is I didn't go ahead and put in pe a PEX loop. And the reason is because the way I had to do this was I, I excavated one side, and then I filled it, and then I excavated another side, and I filled it in. At some point, since I got the backhoe, if I'm in the mood, I can dig a three-foot deep perimeter and do that. Also, uh, this house is built on a ledge, so my depth is really limited. I can't get below the frost line. So I'd have to put some kind of insulation over it to keep it from freezing. Um, so the final hour value on the wall is 35. Um, and it's 35 because I'm also doing a two-inch uh, uh, EPS on the inside wall. So six on the outside, two on the inside, making um, that. And here's my friend Dave's tractor. See, we both have something, right? I got a bag, or he's got a tractor, and I'm backfilling here to uh, get that backfilled. Nice soil around the house. This is all. This is all 1976 fill because this is built on the ledge. They they poured a slab and they brought in a bunch of sandy fill and it is quite dry. It drains beautifully, so I'm very happy about that. One of the things that I'm happy about about the house is the fill. Great. So um, now we're getting to uh, the next bit, which is let's put that poly iso on. So he's uh, my uh, contractor's got a nice six inch ledge of EPS to marry up to, and he's coming. This is the beginning or the middle of January. I think he started January fifteenth. It was a, a rather um, typical winter this winter. It wasn't crazy winter like two thousand ten, where we had eight feet of snow. It wasn't a really warm winter like 2011, where we were in the middle of January and it was 50 degrees for a couple of days. And we did have a lot of freeze thaws, but it was actually a winter. So um, the ground froze, so we couldn't level this out for him to put his scaffolding up. So he did everything on ladders, which he didn't mind. And here's what we did. He went and found the studs inside the wall before he started putting these four-inch screws. The house loved this. The house only has plywood sheathing at the corners. The rest of it is homosote. The entire house is sheathed with sound insulation. It, I was un... I, I can't tell you how that made my jaw drop. So we added two courses of poly iso. The first was with a four-inch screw that went into the, the studs. The second with an eight-inch screw, which did the same thing. We staggered the joints so that there was air sealing qualities to it. Uh, uh, poly iso is rather airtight anyway. Um, then we. Uh, <clears throat> this is re this is repurposed. Exactly. This is second hand. So it had holes in it that we went back with uh, one part uh, foam and just filled those up. I did that, that one part foam. We now know one part foam does not air seal, right? If you put one part foam around your windows and you're trying to get that for an air seal, you're out of luck. It doesn't air seal. You have to add an air sealer to that. You've got to put tape on or whatever. Um, we learned that on top the Tom Moore house in, in, in uh, Shelburne. Um, uh, so uh, I'm ending up with the, in the upstairs, I'm ending up, I've got a two by four wall with fiberglass. I've got a sheathing of homosote, which has actually got an R value that's twice you know, what a regular plywood is, so ooh, ooh, you know, 2.6 or something. So, you know, not horrible, but not great. Um, and in the end, I ended up with the upstairs uh, having that six inches of poly out, so it got a 50, an R50.4 up there. Um, and here's, you can see the two courses. You can even see them fitting into the mouth of the, of the retrofit. So they're going all the way up to the, the prop event, and they're getting into that, that, that mouth there. And here's the front of the house. There's my bay window again. Yay. You can see that the only thing holding it up are two, like, you know, brackets for shelving. It's just amazing. Okay. Um, the poly iso is on. It's time to wrap it up. 
um, we decided to go with the Mento 1000 for the air, for the barrier on the outside. Be, you know, using uh, uh, the Tescon tape for the outside. They have different products. This is the external Tescon Vera, Vara. It's called. Um, it's a paper-based tape. Um, it's a little less stretchy than the other Tescon product, but it's great. It's a, an acrylic tape that that forms a bond with the molecular structure of the thing it's attached to and actually you have to destroy it after a day or two in order to pull it off. So the tape is awesome stuff and it, it's guaranteed for 60 years. Um, yeah, this is 475 and I, I, I give Ken Levinson and Flores down there a, a shout out in, in, in the next... Uh, is, that, uh, is this a better tie back? Is that what that No, this is... Uh, Tyvek has a perm rating of about 38, something like that. Um, Tyvek is actually not at all good for keeping moisture out or letting moisture in. It's wind. No, it's not even an air barrier. It's a wind barrier, which I don't even know where that comes into the whole conversation. Um, but this is a variable vapor open, vapor closed material. If the vapor pressure is coming from the outside, it has a perm rating of 4. So from the outside, rain hits it. I've got a rain screen, so there's a place for evaporation. That is now a, a, got a perm rating of 4. If there's moisture in the wall, it has a perm rating of 34, allowing that to migrate out. This is a German product, high, very cool stuff. Um, Polyiso has got a very low perm rating, but it's got a perm rating. It's around four or five itself. So if there's moisture in there, it will be able to migrate through the, the Mentos back out. And that's that's what I'm hoping for. It wasn't at all wet during the installation. The installation itself wasn't wet. So I'm not expecting there to be, have been a lot of moisture in the wall itself. Um, but if there is, this construction will allow it to migrate out. <clears throat> um, it is twice expensive uh, than Taipar and took twice as long to install because I'm not just throwing it up and running along the wall going tack, 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 tack with a, you know, a hammer or staple gun. I'm actually putting it up and the, the uh, workers working with Caleb Construction for Jim Bradley were really meticulous on making sure there were no holes. They said it took, the first window took them an hour to get right, because it was the first one. They've never never used this stuff before. The next one was 45 minutes, next one was a half hour, and they got it down to about 20 minutes for a window. Um, the rest of it is easy, because you just attach it at the top, drop it down, put it up, and tape it on. You gotta, the, the tape is pressure activated, so you have to press it in order to get it to stick well. But he, I think he did, and I, I think he also had one of those uh, blade things that they use. Uh, he attached it on the top of tape. There, there are no staples on this. So that's basically just all hanging. That's all loose at this point, hanging on the... I think what he did is at, at points he taped a top course and then came over it again and taped the scene. <clears throat> Okay, I want a rain screen. I don't want my, I've got this expensive, beautiful, tight Mento 1000 on there. I don't want my ciders just going up and hammering nails into it. And I need a gap for that evaporation to happen. So we've got um, three quarter inch by four inch stra strapping. And for this, we needed to use 10 inch screws for it. So screw 10 inches long all the way through into the studs. They didn't always hit because when you're going that far, the screw can wander. Um, but for the most part, they were hitting the studs. I'm amazed when I look at the inside wall because my the basement is still unframed, so I could see where they came through, and I caught a couple of them, but but not a whole bunch. And they framed the windows to allow for the trim to be attached to that and the window buck. So we get to the bucks. I've now got a window. It's set in six inches. I need to attach some type of buck to that, that I can put the trim and have that be uh, a construction that will be durable. Um, once again, I'm not expecting the buck to keep water out. The buck is only there to keep out, you know, large water and rain 
there are weep holes. The actual uh, uh, moisture, vapor, and uh, air barrier is already in there. That's, that's here. That goes right to the frame of the window. So this is uh, a window treatment more than it is any kind of weather treatment. He's making it out of PVC for, to make it durable. Uh, he got a special um, jig. This is the jig which allowed him to make these, these uh, special joints so he could screw right in. <clears throat> it worked really well. He's going to lend it to me so I can build the bucks on the inside as well. This is the butt. No, the inside is going to be wood. But, but the, the, the jig works for anything. It's not specific for, for PVC. Uh, this is one of the, um, the bucks in place, and then this is the trim being attached to it. Haven't you already replaced your windows? Yeah, that's why the, we're not replacing windows here at all. The windows are the windows. Mm -hmm. The bucks are actually going attaching around the window, and they're being held in place by the trim and through the, the actual side of the buck into the side uh, framing. I asked Ken Levinson about that. If you penetrate the, uh, the Mento 1000, as long as there's pressure and, and some kind of area around it, just like when you have a nut, when you're screwing down, you're not actually screwing the nut, you're pulling the two surfaces together. If there's pressure around the penetration, you shouldn't have any leakage around that. Right, here's my bay window. We've got to get rid of the bay window. Imagine trying to add six inches of insulation around this bay window and then trying to detail it. You'd be sticking, your insulation would be sticking out beyond this ledge and you'd have to come back somehow to the window. It just doesn't make any sense. So we just decided to get rid of it. That's what we ended up with, with just a picture frame window. It looks great. The views are, I have a view of Mount Mansfield out my front window, so it's a great view and the light is beautiful. Um, we lost a place to put our plants, but that happens. Um, <clears throat> right, and this gets the same framing. Okay, my outside chimney. Uh, I'm working down the list here. Uh, my outside chimney, uh, you can see that I've already insulated the uh, subgrade part of it. That was all cinder block to a certain point and then turned into brick. That's the EPS. Um, originally, this was not in the scope. I was not going to insulate the chimney. And then I just decided if I don't do it now, I'm never going to do it. So uh, just after we had the presentation last year from Steve Spatz on his use of uh, rigid Roxel, uh, I talked to him. I got the name of a, the, his supplier. We talked to the supplier. We ordered it. It cost $770 for six inches of Roxel for the entire chimney plus the cost of installation. <clears throat> so, you go with the same well, first of all, I want something uh, uh, fireproof against the chimney, and Roxwell is fireproof. I didn't want polyiso, which is not fireproof. But that's to rub the chimney all the way up. All the way up to the, we went, we ended up, for visual reasons, going all the way up to the to the eave there, all the way up to the, the end of the gable. Um, it also gave us an opportunity to uh, continue the insulation all the way around the chimney and attach it to the six inches of... $700 of six inches. So it's two boards of three. Yeah, exactly. And what we ended up doing is uh, we ended up taking one board and attaching it to the brick with, with masonry screws into the into the chink between, into the masonry between. And then we added a layer of um, uh, plywood, and not pressure treated plywood, plain old plywood. We want that plywood to get wet if it has to get wet, and dry out if it has to dry out. So we, we're not trying to stop the natural processes. And then adding another layer of rock on top of that, because getting a 10 inch screw through six inches of, poly, of, of rock soil into a molly that you put in the wall was not going to happen. So Jim said, let's attach one layer, let's put the, the, pop, the plywood on, then we can screw the next layer into the plywood, and then Mentos on top of that. So that's the rock soil going all the way up the chimney. Now, of course, Passive House would say, get rid of the chimney, just X the chimney. I wanted to but I use my wood stove for heating. And my wife loves the cozy factor of the fireplace. 
So we decided just to, to take the hit and have the, the chimney wrapped. This wrapping actually is going, um, the insulation in the attic is going to stop about two feet below the top of this here. So I've got overlap. Yes, there is a thermal bridge there. Yes, there's nothing I can do about it. But I'm doing as much as I can. And at least I'm not heating the Vermont winter for the majority of the, the chimney. On the top, I'm, I'm actually building a, uh, a steel flash for that, which is going a cap that's going to shed water on both sides. And then I'm going to do a, uh, a lead flashing detail in the um, actual masonry. So you didn't run it all the way to the top? I, if you were to look here, this line is this line. So it, it mimics the, the line of the roof. It's just I'm, I'm shooting at an angle, so you can't really see that. OK, here's that classic, um, the downstairs walls. Now we're downstairs. Downstairs is going to have a different R value, because I'm doing that 7 and a quarter inch rock sole inside the wall. So you can see here, I've got 2 inches of e XPS. So this is the south wall. That's where the garage was. And I'm going to bring that up here to finish that off. This piece I'm pulling off, because I want to do e uh, EPS on this. So I'm gluing EPS onto a wall like this. That's giving me um, a pr pretty much a 10 inch thick cinder block wall from the outside of the cinder block to the inside, which is the reason I'm saying the outside of the cinder block. The outside of the cinder block is where the sheathing comes in, which is where my 2x4 starts. So the outside of this 2x4 is at the outside of the cinder block, and that difference I have to build out, and I'm going to fill that with rock soil. And then further to, f to make the wall flat, I have to come up further to the two inches that I'm going to be putting of the XPS on the wall. I have a picture of that in a second. So the total R value of that wall after I'm done is going to be 66. And here's a wall that I finished. Um, here is the XPS. Here is a continuation of that um, sill plate. Um, of course, the sill plate is here because the wall is higher. The two walls are different. On the east wall, it's only 26 inches. On the west wall, it's 35 inches. So this is a 35 inch tall. Yeah, that's what this piece of wood is. This piece of wood is an extension of the sill plate coming out to meet the plane of the EPS after it's been glued on. Then I added um, these 2x4s. These 2x4s are standard 2x4s. That gives me 7 inches. I'm just going to take a hit on the quarter inch. Instead of seven and a quarter, it's going to be seven inch. Because I didn't want to mess with a gap in there, an unfilled gap of a quarter inch. <clears throat> and what you see up here is I've attached some Intello. Intello is another intelligent membrane for more air sealing and for uh, allowing that, that uh, rock sole to breathe. It's really not needed. I've got a perfectly good air barrier on the outside of the house. I'm playing here. I wanted to see how this stuff worked. I wanted to get my hands on it. And I wanted to see, we're going to do a third blower door test at some point in the future, if adding that changes anything. So here's the rock sole in the cavities that I made by adding the 2x4. Here you can see the Intello. I, I just tacked it up there. And then I just let it fall down. I'm going to be adding another strip. I'm actually going to be terminating it on top of the EPS. And then I'm going to be um, adding another uh, two and a, I think it's five eighths in order to bring that all out so that I have one wall plane. I'm going to have a, a, a raceway back there uh, that I can put uh, sockets in that won't be outside of that air barrier. They'll be on the inside of the air barrier, and I'll be able to run anything I want back there. Okay. I had a wood stove. My wood stove was an atmospheric wood stove. I was taking air from my inside. I was blowing it out through the chimney. Can't do it. I need to get that air tightness. A chimney is a huge hole that's sucking air out of your house and sending up this huge hole. So I put, I made a plate that I had the chimney people at Brickliners come and install, and they put a, a high temperature sealant around that, so that's sealed, and around the chimney entrance itself. But I needed a fresh air access. 
So we decided to go straight through the back of the chimney to get that. Malcolm and I had been talking about, because there's a, actually a double flue here, a lot of people go through the double flue and all the way up for the fresh air. After discussing it with Jim uh, Bradley, we decided that um, there are certain factors and stack effects that could take place that we decided we wanted to negate. So we're going straight through the back of the chimney, so it got a horizontal in. We did put a slight pitch on it, so if there's any condensation coming in, that'll drain back outside. Um, and we went through the two courses of stone, and um, come on. That's it from the outside. So here's looking through the two layers of three inches. There's one layer of three inch of rock sole. Here's my um, my uh, plywood, and here's the other layer of rock sole. Rock sole. Yeah, this was already it was already done. They drilled all the way through the rock sole, so I saw where we were. I cut open a hole that would allow for this, and then I refilled it with rock sole that I had just the loose rock sole that I had. And here you see the tube coming out. What, what in here is the before and the rock? Uh, timing. I couldn't get them to come and do it in time. And uh, Are you using your wood stove anyway? After no, at this point, time? at this point, the house, I, I still had my oil heat going. I didn't have to use the wood stove. I went all completely over to oil. Actually, I got to a point, one of those classic moments in planning in your own house. I got to a point where I ran out of oil. It was the end of January. I still have two months left of the heating season. I don't want to buy any more oil, but I went and bought 100 gallons. So I got, I've got 100 gallons of oil. I got to use it or give it to someone to use at some point. So I went over to using only oil for the last bit. Um, and as soon as it got to be 45 degrees and sunny, the house did not need any heat anymore. It was easily above 70 degrees just with the, so the, the uh, solar heat gains. So here's one of those gaskets. I love 475 products. This is a gasket. It's a three inch gasket. You put it around. It's really tight. You put it up against. Use some of that Tescon to seal it. Why did you go with the flex? That is what they they went with. That was their their they required using a stainless steel um, when uh, brick liners. So when I'm working with, I'm not a chimney specialist. I know some stuff, but when I'm dealing with a chimney specialist and they say this is what we do, I said okay. Um, the, uh, I could have gone, the, the nice thing about it is that it is not seamed, so there are no seams to have to, to deal with, um, which is probably where they use it. The downside is that it is it ha does have this kind of coil in it, so moisture will have a, a slightly more difficult time getting out of it, although I'm not really all that worried about about that um, at this time. What is the gasket you're talking about? This is the 475 gasket. It's a silicone gasket. Um, and it's uh, uh, this is for a three inch. Uh, the the three inch is actually about an inch and a half wide, and it you have to stretch it out to get it on. And it's got a really nice tight fit on there. Um, and uh, this is the Tescon tape. This is my helper. This is my daughter Iris. She's nine, and she was helping me drill things in. So in order to get the uh, the same standoff for the siding guys to come back and attach siding to this properly. I had to build this out, and I put a PVC stop on it. So this is the final look. In the end, it had a it has um, vinyl siding, and I know people don't like vinyl siding, but it had it had vinyl siding. I'm cantilevering whatever siding I've got off of six inches off of these screws, these ten inch screws that are going to my siding, and I just you know threw and into my studs. I decided I did not want to try to put anything heavier on there. The vinyl siding was inexpensive. It was quick to go on. It had vinyl siding on when I had it. This is not. Also, I, I'm not. I'm an engineer. I like function over form. And as far as I'm concerned, vinyl siding has the same function as a more expensive cementitious siding or whatever. Never have to paint it. It'll be there for 20 years, maybe even 30, maybe even 40, and I'm fine with that. Um, I don't care what it looks like, and it looks okay. I'll have a picture at the end. The cement board is too heavy? Way too heavy. Yeah, cement board would not have worked. Um, you're talking about hundreds and hundreds of pounds hanging off of the screws that are holding this insulation up. It would have been, it would have been a disaster. Um, 
<clears throat> so, yeah. Do you actually know that? I don't. I didn't do any engineering on it, but I just felt it. And also, I didn't want to go to expense of it. <laughs> the other thing is that... There is a siding that's, uh, that's not boards, but when I go to a yard, you know, it's wood siding. Yeah. It's made of cement or boards or something. Yep. But we are talking about hundreds and hundreds of pounds of extra weight on the outside of that. And I, like I said, I didn't do any engineering. I just, you know, thought, first of all, I don't want the expense. Second of all, actually, the cement board has to get painted every, by the same, well, when you talk to the manufacturer, they really tell you every, after the first 10 years, you should paint it. And then every five years after that, this is certain tweed or whatever. No, not certain tweed. What is it? The uh, party? Hardy board. Hardy yeah. will warrant it for 25 years. Yeah, but if you look, if you look, if you look at the warranty a little more closely, they're not yeah. quite as, as gracious. Years, 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 yeah, that's what I mean. Yeah. Is that they're talking really yeah. on all of the I'll factors. Never mind, it's brittle. It has a tendency to crack. You have to replace one. You're you have to you take courses off and pot and, and replacing it could be difficult. There are other products that I could have used, but I decided just to stick with siding, with the vinyl that's, siding. That's also consideration for new construction. I'd never do this in new construction. In new construction, I'd build a double wall, and I'd have I, I just I'd have it structurally right. I'd either do a double wall or I'd do the wall with the TJIs. And uh, we're even talking amongst us about trying to go straight TJI, right? Trying to get a two by four, two by four TJI, and just forget hanging it off and just fill the whole thing. They get a 17-inch TGA, whatever they'll make, and just fill the cellulose and, and have that be it. Um, okay, uh, penetrations. When you're dealing with an old house, there are penetrations you don't know you have until you're there. Um, even if you walk around and look at everything, you may forget something. Um, so here are my, here's my list of penetrations. I had to have all this done before the siding guys began. Um, of course, I got a call. I said, I want to be kind of soft on when the siding guys begin, so I have time to do my penetration so I'm doing my other work. And I got a call, they're coming on Monday. <laughs> and I said, okay. So I spent the weekend doing penetrations. Um, fortunately, uh, Ken Levinson uh, uh, and Flores down at 475 um, sent up uh, express mail all of my wonderful penetration gaskets like this one for a wire. Um, I have the HRV supply and exhaust duct, those are those seven inch holes. Um, outside garden hose, well water supply hose, which is the water coming through my cinder block at the, at the slab to bring my fresh water in because I have a well. Outside lights, outside electric sockets, fresh air supply for the wood stove, which we just saw. Uh, old floor drains in the garage, which I missed until we did a cursory blower door test and noticed there was absolutely no change. <laughs> um, and the old attic air uh, access for the attic. Um, and there's my, my plug for 475. Um, these gaskets are inexpensive, they're quick, and they are really tight. I was doing, I did one because I ran out of gaskets with tape it's not as good. I would easily just go for the extra money and do that. And check here. Yeah. Just slide it to the, uh, uh, you know it has a hole already. You just push it on. Mm -hmm. These are all already permeated. You, you, you buy it for one or two or whatever penetrations you have, Romex or whatever, and it, it works perfectly. So I've got cats. And I had my Mento 1000 up there for about a month before the siding was coming up. And I went outside before the siding guys came and I saw this. My cat was using my house as a scratching post. And not just here, but in like five places. So I went around and I had to seal those with tape, which really upset me. And then I went around and I put pieces of plywood up against the house where the cat had been doing it to stop the cat from doing it. Ugh. Could have just tied a piece of plywood with the cat's tail. Yeah, that would have, yeah, yeah, that would have worked. Yeah. So here's my uh, HRV penetration. This is the exhaust penetration with another one of the 475 gaskets. I have 17 pictures of the different stages of me cutting this hole. But in the end, um, that is is the penetration. It did, it did get cut off flush with the... Uh, I have a similar treatment uh, as this with the PVC. Um, 
so that there's something for them to go to. Um, and that is then where I cut it off. But this air sealing is at that point. And that's an insulated duct? That is the insulated. This is um, uh, a Zender pipe. Zender pipe, exactly. Um, here is my water uh, supply. It doesn't look like that, of course, now, because there's six inches of EPS around it, and I use one part foam, and I use the Suprema. And on the inside, I sealed it off, uh, filling a hole there with one part foam and then using the Tescon tape. Here's my attic hatch. Um, that is something that I also, I put a piece of Mentos up, I taped it to the framing, and I screwed this up and into place. And that was not leaking at all when we did the blower door test. Here is the culprit. My garage was a garage. And the guy I bought the house from would park his snow-covered cars in there and found that he was pooling water. So what did he do? He put in floor drains. I had forgotten about these. When I put the new wall in, I did cut off the floor drain, but I hadn't sealed it. So I went ahead and I covered these up put some Mentos in, knocked it back down, and just covered them up like that. This is going to get two inches of, it's going to get a, a uh, um, moisture barrier, uh, subfloor moisture barrier, two inches of EPS, subfloor, and a floor on top of it. So that is going to be done. Radon? I had it tested for radon years ago, and it was 0.04 micron, so it was almost undetectable. Yes, um, EPS out. Did you get the compression strength for, for using EPS tool? has five or six different types. Type 1, no. Type 2, yes. No. Type 3, yes. Type 4, yes. Type 5, yes. The compression strength of the EPS that I bought, the type 2 EPS, sorry about that, um, is 132 PSI. Mm -hmm. So it's like the 25 pound? That is the, that is, yeah, I think that's it. I mean, we I, I have the list at home yeah. um, of what, what Joel right. sent me, but the type 2 I told him what I was doing. I'm putting this down on my floor. I'm going to have subflooring on top of it. He said this is more than enough. I mean, 135, 132 PSI is, is perfect. Do have to make sure that you're not walking on it because it will dent before you have a, a layer on top of it. I think Joel also has a product that I mean, yeah. has EPS, a waterproof sort of duple thing on yeah. the name. Yeah. And then but that is much more. $7 for for four square feet. Yeah. So it was like $4,000 just for that for my 1,000 square foot basement. It was $1,000 for the EPS. And that included the EPS for the perimeter. So I, yeah. <laughs> I'd i rather, and it's going to be like $700 in subfloor and it's going to be, but it's not going to be $6,000. All together with the floor uh, and the subfloor, it's going to be about two thousand dollars. So, so it's. Are a, you attaching the fire and just gluing it to it? Somewhere? No, it's floating. Okay. So it's tongue groove subfloor. Tongue groove subflooring, uh, Vantech type. Yeah. Uh, Home Depot has a twenty-seven dollar per sheet product right now. That's what I'm using. They also have a thirty-five dollar sheet. I'm just. Some strapping. No, no strapping. It's floating. Just floating. Absolutely, and and with this product, that's fine. With a. Type 2 EPS, you have more than enough strength, you don't need it. I'm not gluing it. No, I'm, I'm, Would you have done just like uh, the click floors or the bamboo floors? Yeah, but that's that's the flooring. On t I talked to Joel about that. Hmm. I talked to Jim Cleb, to Jim Bradley about that. Both of them said yes, but. And if you talk to the, if you talk to the bamboo flooring, because that's what I want to put down, um, they said no subgrade application because they're worried about moisture, they're worried about delamination. So if you're going to do that, then you really do need something under it to, to give that extra compression strength. I was thinking click on top of it, sure. And then I thought, do I really want to, if it doesn't work, do I really want to pull that up? Because I know I've got some heavy tools. I'm going to be rolling, you know, 300, 400 pound things over this. Do I want click laminate to really be taking that or do I want some, you know, tongue and groove, you know, 30, 23, 30 seconds uh, stuff under there. And it is bringing my, my ceiling down a little bit. I, I'm, I'm just going for that. So here we are on the HRV. Uh, challenge of, of uh, installing an HRV in an existing home. 
the plan I got back from from when you put in an HRV in your house, whether it's a new house or an old house, you send your floor plan to Zender and they'll do an analysis and give you a plan. If you aren't using Zender, you can do it with Ultimate Air, they do the same thing. Where Zender decided to put the ducts was very inconvenient for me. They put them in the middle of walls, they put them where I have furniture, they put them where it would be really hard to run the, the tubes. I want to. I am living in this house while I'm doing this. I am not moving my family out. We're just here. I don't want dust in there the whole time. So what I did is I redesigned it to allow all the same flows, all the same supplies, not close to a door, which is what Zender is looking for. They don't want to short circuit the system. They want it to, to you to have good flow. We're doing whole house ventilation, right? We're supplying to our living spaces, which we're extracting from our, our wet places. Kitchens, bathrooms, mudrooms get extract. Bedrooms, living rooms, TV rooms, studies, offices get supplied. Um, and then the, the supply air is drawn through to the exhaust air, increasing the air changes and the, the, the freshness of the air. So once again, here we are in my daughter's room. Uh, there's her closet, which I had cleaned out so that I could actually do this. I put all of my ducts on walls that were closets. So I'm coming through the inside of the closet, which I can rip to shreds and not care about, make one hole in her actual wall, and have all of that go straight through the floor into my unfinished basement, thank goodness, ceiling, and just running it through my joists to my mechanical room. <clears throat> Here's the hole that I ended up making in her wall, which is meeting the larger hole on the other side to allow me to put the uh, the actual uh, head in. This is my drill. That's the size of the hole I had to make in her closet to make the hole going down into through the flooring, subfloor, and flooring to get to the basement. It's inside the closet. Inside the closet, exactly. And that is then the, the first cut that's going through the two by four, and there's just a piece of subflooring there in a three quarter inch. I got right through that without a problem. No joints? You missed the joints? I oh checked. I checked. I, I measured, I measured, and I drilled a hole through, and I said, oh, I didn't hit the joist, and then I thought I could go ahead. I mean, I could have done the, the, the crazy thing and just drilled it, oh, da, 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 hit the joist and go, oh, great, now I have to go back and do it again. No, I checked. Um, so here's the head. Uh, this is a supply duct, and here it is afterwards with the actual plate on the top. It is higher than Zender would like. Zender would like all of these supply ducts to be between floor and three feet to cut down on stratification. But my daughter closes her door at night, which means that it's getting sucked under the door undercut anyway. So the stratification is not going to be a problem. Uh, let's see. Nope. Okay. Um, okay. I'm experiencing something. So... Um, my, my advice here, first of all, I, I ended up with the, the Comfo Air 350. I was hoping to get a slightly smaller unit, but they're all the same price, so it doesn't matter. It was 50. The efficiency is different. The efficiency is different, and that's the point, is that if I was able to go with the CA200, that has a 93% efficiency, and the CA350 is 84% efficient. So that is, a, I'm taking a hit on that. But as you'll see, the numbers that I would get on the, on the increase in efficiency are not going to change my NBTU per hour number enough to make that worthwhile, and it wasn't enough for the size of house. The CA200 is really for a 250 square meter house. That's where they get it from, and that is about, you know, about a 1,500 square foot house, pushing it to push, put it in a 2,000 square foot which this is. How much was the Zender you used? The Zender with all of this stuff was $5,500. Um, but I'm doing the install myself, so uh, and I add that in my labor. I, just, I have a bit on that. Which, how much was the unit itself? 50, the unit itself is $2,900, $2,700. And then all the, it's about half unit, half ducting mm -hmm. and plenums and Lots that parts and pieces. Lots of parts and pieces. We're putting one in there. Yeah. <laughs> So um, the reason, like I said, just to, to, to recap, the reason I'm doing it this way is to re reduce the, the disruption in occupied spaces. My wife said, oh, you're going to be um, uh, putting holes in the walls. Oh, no, oh, no. And yeah. I am. I'm putting holes in the walls. Um, but, but, but how did you go 
climb the whole thing from the second floor all the way down to the other floor? Well, here, this is the, the this is the, goes between my daughter's floor and the ceiling of the basement. The ceiling of the basement is open joists. I'm just running it straight through the joists and into my mechanical room. Yeah, but the, your daughter's room is uh, all. It's There's only one. It's a two-floor house. Oh, yeah. So here's the, the the floor of her room, and here's the ceiling of the basement. I'm going like this, like that, and oh, straight. There is, no, there is not a second floor. Or well, no, no. See, you're you're doing the European thing, which is what I used to do as well. The first floor is called the bottom floor and then the second floor is called the first floor and this first floor the second floor is called the so in, in America we just have a different way of doing it the second floor is when you have to climb a set of stairs the first floor is where you walk into the house usually um, and sometimes you go to parts of the country where they say well that's the ground floor and that's the first floor okay the semantics um, there are two floors the basement floor which is a walk-in basement is or not even a, a basement really it really is the the first floor uh, and the second floor that's what i'm using or upstairs and downstairs is another another dino so you, you you're putting the unit in what the garage used to be yes in my mechanicals room um i don't have a picture of that in this presentation but it is my old uh it's my laundry room i threw it on the wall it's where the heating plant was and it's where my my uh electric uh, hot water heater is so you need two by tens a little yeah, I've got. I don't have to cut them my two by tens because it's an old house, and the beam has the two by tens on top. So I just run right through them. It's beautiful. I'm really fortunate. Just because that part of the old house means that I don't have to go over my main joist beam. My main mid house joist beam has the joists on top. I've got nine and a quarter inches to run my my hose. So if you're running through. perpendicular, you just do the chase against the wall, or? Yeah, I'm doing a chase against the far wall. I'm running all the way to the end, and I'm running back in, and I'm doing a chase against the far wall. And that's that's the best way to do it for me. And I have the opportunity, if I want to, to to put it in that chase in that that wall bit that I have that is empty. I can actually uh, set that that chase way into that, so it's small. It's pure small enough. What size hole were you drilling? So it's a three and a eighth is what I drilled, okay. but you can go with a three. I just had... Really? You could get that through yeah. a three? You could, um, it would be tight, but I went with three and an eighth just yeah. to give myself a little wiggle room. Okay. So, I don't need 112,000 BTU oil burner anymore. I can actually get rid of it. So, the way I've modeled this is I went from 112,000 BTUs to 21,000 BTUs, which is an 82% reduction which is nowhere near Enerfit. It's three times Enerfit, because Enerfit is 7.75 you know, uh, kilobtus per square foot per, per year, and this is around 24, 25. But I'm really happy with it anyway. I can't tell you 82% is much better than nothing. So something I didn't tell you, I'll just go back here just for a second. When I had my uh, wood stove, my wonderful wood stove, which I had a picture of up here. Let me just find it. Sorry. It didn't have an outside air supply. So I had to buy a new one, which was an unexpected cost. So this 20-year-old wood stove gave way to, fortunately, a used... I know it's in here somewhere. Okay, well, it's not really that important, the picture of that. Um, gave way to a used a hearthstone stove, a $1,500 stove, is a you know, $2,200 stove they had used, um, plus the installation. So that's a bump I wasn't expecting. I thought, I can just buy the outdoor air supply for this stove that I have and run the thing and I'll be done. Maybe, you know, $700 in paying brick liners to come do the work, but not a new stove and the fresh air supply on top of that end, end, end. So that's a hit I took, uh, unexpected consequences. But... It's a stove that's big enough to heat the whole house on itself. And it has a 12-hour burn. So I can put in a whole bunch of wood. The one I had was a six-hour burn. So I've got a much larger firebox in this one. Put in a whole bunch of wood, leave it for 12 hours, and I'm good. I'm also adding an air-to-air -air heat pump. I've modeled the house at 21,000 BTUs per hour. I'm putting in the 18,000 BTU hyperheat 
the 18,000 BTUs is the cooling capacity, not the heating capacity. The heating capacity is 22,500 BTUs. So I'm just covering my heating capacity. So if I go away for a week in the middle of the winter and I don't ask my sister to come and take care of the house and keep the wood fire going, I can be pretty sure that the house isn't going to freeze. How can you afford to go away for the week in the middle of the winter after all this? <laughs> My wife has got a career. I have a job. My wife has got a career. Um, she, so if, if we can afford it, uh, we actually have to stay at home because the kids are in skiing lessons, but that's another thing. We're, um, we're going to be monitoring this house. I just have that in the bottom. And if it ends up that I don't have enough heating capacity with that one heat pump to be able to leave the house unattended, I'll put in another heat pump. We'll see how that goes. Nice thing about heat pumps, heat pumps heat and cool. I don't think it's going to freeze either. Yeah. I, I don't think so either. Yeah. And that's not including my solar, you know, other other factors. I mean, it has the internal heat gains and the solar heat gains in there, but there, I'm hoping I'm hoping that that's going to be enough. Yeah. I'm fine with that. I'm fine with it getting to 40 if I'm not at home, you know, as long as it doesn't. Now, here's another thing. I am pulling out my oil heating system. I've got a lot of copper I'm selling. I've got, you know, maybe two thousand dollars worth of copper tubing that I'm pulling out. Radiators and runs and all of that is going. I'm going to bring that over to Queen City and I'm going to get my money back from that copper. Copper is expensive at this particular moment. It also means the only things that are there to burst are my water. I don't have any hydronic more that can burst and leak out all over the place and refill itself because the fill is open. You know the stories, you just hear them. So, I'm, I'm, first of all, I turn my pump off when I leave, so if there is a burst, it's not going to keep filling the house with water. And second of all, I'm going to have a lot less opportunity for something, places where that's going to happen. So, the costs. Retrofits are expensive. It costs at least 30% of the value of the house to do a retrofit. We've seen that on other passive house retrofits that have been presented at conferences. I reduce the cost by doing as much of the work of myself and by using repurposed materials when possible. I hire professionals when I have stuff that I need to make sure that it's done right. I mean, I'm an engineer, but I'm not a builder, so I, I can learn things from builders, but I don't have years and years of experience. Um, and um, I found my builder at Better Building by Design. Jim Kaleb had won four awards that year for doing two inches of insulation on the outside and air sealing. And I was like, okay, well, that I, this guy I can work with. And I have not been happier with a contractor in my life. This guy is really on his business and takes everything personally. He, I had him come over to my house. We, we had a consult about it, something else completely. He came over and said, would you bring your blower door, to, blower, blower door with you to do a quick blower door test just because I want for the presentation. I want to know where we're at. I, we went to do a blower door test on the house that we blower doored originally, which was with the, the garage not a, 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 as a part of it, we thought. So I thought that that partition wall was some kind of air barrier. Not. The garage, I hadn't done any air sealing on. So when he did the blower door test, it was, the original blower door test was 1800, it was 1740 or something. <laughs> <laughs> and he was like, oh no, I've ruined this house and put $20,000, $30,000 worth of air sealing in it and it's not air sealed. So Jim came back yesterday morning after I'd spent the entire weekend going back and making sure that everything was ready and that the garage was a part of the envelope. And we went ahead and redid the, the blower door test, and it ended up being great. So I'll tell you in a second. So here are the estimated costs. The air sealing and outside insulation was was given uh, uh, thirty five thousand dollars. Flooring I put down three thousand. Do you have the price per uh, square meter or square? I can. It's a two thousand square foot house, and I've got my no, calculator, so we can. Oh, the 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 area of all of the insulation. I, I can I can get that to, for you, no problem. Um, the area, price per area that are covered. Um, drywall, 5000 I haven't done it yet, but uh, this one I'm expecting to cost. I'm going to put the drywall up. This is for the mud guy to come in and do a skim coat and make it all pretty. 
I, I've done drywall before, and my wife is like, if we're doing this, <laughs> you're hiring someone to do the mud work on the drywall. Um, when I bought a furnace to replace the furnace that busted, the furnace that busted was a combo, so it was doing heat and hot water, and I got a replacement that was only hot water, uh, but was only heating, so I bought an electric hot water heater. I was thinking about doing uh, a, a heat pump hot water heater, but after talking to Peter Schneider, those things use so much air and cool the room down that they're in so much in order to heat that water that you're going to freeze that room. And that's my living space. That's not an outside space. That's a house, a part of the house that I actually use. It's where the dog sleeps. It's, so it's not a good idea? It's not a good idea unless you do something special, like make a special room for it that is specially sealed from things and you're only using outside air. Look, during the, the warm season, it's great. You're getting really cheap. They're $2,000 not installed. So you're probably talking three grand installed. As soon as it's the winter months, you're freezing your basement to heat that, to heat the water. I'm spending $40 a month to heat my hot water with this electric heater. It isn't ideal. I don't have a solar domestic hot water heater yet. But it cost me $300. I did the install myself. I, I, I grew up doing theatrical electrician work. So doing, you know, running an electrical circuit is nothing for me. It was no problem. And I had an electrician check my work to make sure there's code and all that. The ventilation system was 5500 The air-to-air -air heat pump is going to cost about $5,000. That's, that's what I estimated. It's going to be a little less than that. It hasn't been installed yet. But I'm not going to install it myself. And the reason I'm not installing it myself, even though I took the course, was because I want the warranty. I want these guys to come back if it doesn't work. And I don't want to buy all the equipment to do the charging myself. And where you supposed to get a certification? I, I was going to get certification in um, doing the charge. But the equipment to do the charge is about three to $4,000 in and of itself. So... And then I'm going to start an HVAC company. No, it's not. I was thinking I could do one here, I could do one there. And in the end, if you become the guy who installed it, or the person, I don't want to be sexist, I am a guy, so I usually say guy. But if you're the person who installs it and something goes wrong, you're responsible for that. I'm just a, a, a person uh, with uh, an energy consulting company who does some heat pumps. I'd much rather leave all that liability on someone else. Where did you get your heat pump for five thousand? That's installed. The heat pump itself is about twenty three hundred dollars. The Mitsubishi Hyperheat. Yeah. Sure, sure. Washer dryer. Yeah. What did you do about that? The washer I'm leaving alone. The dryer I'm going to a, a, a condensing unit. Right now, what I'm doing is I'm opening the window and I'm sticking my dryer vent out the window because I don't want the penetration and, and that's fine for right now. Uh, so I'm saving up for a condensing unit, but I am going to go condensing. What do they cost? Uh, about a grand. Uh, and the vinyl siding I had estimated from, from what I heard from Jim at, at $10,000. So unexpected cost. The new wood insulation. Insulation. That's the all. That was the the whole all of the insulation. And it ended up being quite on on the money because it was it was four grand for the insulation on the outside. It was a thousand for the insulation on the inside. So maybe maybe a little more in the end. Thirty five thousand was only the insulation. The thirty five thousand is only his work. That was not the materials. Oh. That no. That did include the uh, the cost of the uh, four seven five products. <clears throat> and whatever other stuff he needed. Mm -hmm. Screws and 475 stuff. Broken out, it, it was three grand. Three grand, okay. Yeah, I have that number. Um, so I wasn't expecting to buy a new wood stove or paying $700 to have it installed. I wasn't expecting to replace the bay window until we got there and we were like, how are we going to detail this? And there's the extra three grand for the Mentos and the uh, time to install it. Not, what that means is the Mentos was twice as expensive as Tyvek, and it took twice as long to install. So 1500 for the extra cost, and 1500 approximately for the extra time. Um, and then my labor. I'm doing a lot of stuff for free because it's my house, my project. If we want to cost this up to see what it would cost if we paid someone to do this, digging and putting the, the subgrade insulation around the, the perimeter of the house, approximately $5,000. 
installing the HRV in the ducting, I'm putting three, it might be two, it might be four. It's not going to be a one, two, three. You got to close up the penetrations and, and drywall them and all that stuff also. And then the, um, the wall construction, floor insulation and flooring, um, just my labor on that, I'm putting at $10,000 for the rest of the downstairs. That's to finish. Um, so with those things added on, <clears throat> my actual out-of-pocket is 77000 so I'm about $7,000 over budget, but that's the wood stove and the bay window. I wasn't expecting it. So my estimate is okay. And um, if you add my labor on, it's about $95,000. That's a lot of money. Um, what are the results? Yeah? What about incentives? I'm going to, uh, Jim just put in for the incentive. We, we started this job last year, and when we got to the end of the year, Jim okayed it through the person he's working with here at Efficiency Vermont to extend it to this year, so we were able to bridge the year. And I'm going to be getting about $2,000 back. Um, so, yeah, I'm going to max out. <laughs> and then you're getting money back for the heat pump, too. I'll be getting $750 back for the heat pump. So instead of 4000 for the heat pump, which you see I brought some of these numbers went down, it's going to be 3250 And instead of, I can take another. So so let's say I got, you know, $3,000 back on this. So we're still talking $92,000 in the greater scheme of things. I don't see $3,000 as being a make or break decision for someone. It's the $95,000 that's the make or break decision. Almost 50% of what you pay for the house. Well, it, yeah, because of my labor in there. It's, it's, it's something on the other, it's near 40% at this point. So at the beginning you said when you bought it, it was appraised for $240,000? Yeah, that's what I paid for it. Yeah. I think it's a two sixty dollars now was with the last appraisal and once the basement is finished and the lister is like drooling to get into my house to reappraise, relist the house because that's taxes for them, right? It's like, oh, you're going to finish another third of the house. <laughs> we got to, oh, there's going to be another. So the house is going to probably go up to about $320,000 once, once the garage is finished just because of extra added uh, finished space. And if I can get an appraiser who will use energy efficiency as a part of the, the thing, it could be as much as three. Um, but we'll see. Um, so here are the results. The heating load reduced from 112,000 BTUs to 21,000 BTUs. Three times the interfit number. Why am I not hitting the interfit number? Well, I didn't get the new windows. I didn't go for the intus. I didn't go for the clear wall. I didn't go for a, a passive house window. I'm only putting two pit inches of EPS on top of my slab. I'm not breaking my slab up, dinging it out, and putting 11 or 12 or 10 inches of EPS under the slab. I'm not doing it. And exactly, I'd, I'd be crawling into my house. I, don't know. I was thinking about three inches of EPS, but then I was thinking I'm I'm putting another inch and a half on top of that with subfloor and flooring, and um, it's getting small there. I don't like that. That was just a choice I made. Um, or yeah. The no, the whole house. I'm pulling up the the, the 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 slab is all the way through the house. The guy I bought the house from just threw some laminate on top of you know that you know sixteenth of an inch or whatever it is. Put, put on an actual, um, basement. Well, it's it's first of all, it's not a real basement just because it it has full windows and has frame wall for most of it, yeah. but um, it does not. It, the slab is cold. I mean, right now, without the unexpected consequences, I super insulated the outside of the house. It was 85 degrees last week. It was like 58 degrees in my basement because I'd insulated the basement so well. The cold wasn't getting out. The heat wasn't getting in. And it was like having the air conditioning. We were wearing sweaters downstairs. It was 85 degrees out. It was amazing. I'll have redistribution of all that when I get that completely installed. That's true. So... Um, Orientation, last thing is the orientation is all wrong. I've got a 42-foot axis north, uh, you know, north-south looking to a beautiful view of the mountain, but I've got, a, you know, when I pull up my PHPP and I see what my losses and gains are, solar losses and gains, it just kills me because it's like 32,000 BTUs in losses and like 5,000 in gains. It's not even close to the standard wash on a, on a passive house. Um, if I could reorient it and change that, I'd, I'd have a much better situation. 
Yay! It went from 1800 CFM to 425 CFM. And we found that we were like, okay, where, why is it not 390? Where, where's this extra leak coming from? We went over to the chimney and it ends up that when the guys were installing that, that stopper, they forgot to caulk one seam. So we're like, wow, just feel the air running through that. So I called the, the brick liners back up and I said, you guys got to come at your own cost to fix this because I paid good money when there was the, the stove was out and everything was, was perfect. You guys should have done it right. But this is the number Jim was the, the fresh air supply. Fresh air supply. That's, that's sealed perfectly. No, it was the chimney itself, the flue, has got a metal uh, stop in it. And they caulked really well around three of the sides, but not one of the sides, the longest side, actually, the side that faces the house. You just stick your fingers up in there. So they just didn't do it right. So they got to come back, and they got to fix it. And Jim was estimating, just from his professional opinion, about 30 to 40 CFM just right there. So we're talking 390 uh, 385. What was the temperature inside and outside? The temperature inside was 66, and the temperature outside was in the mid 50s. But I wouldn't have changed your mind. No. He did have some trouble with the with getting the baseline because it was windy, mm -hmm. but he went out and put it in a bottle, and that that. Would we use the other? I'm not. I don't think so. I think what he did is he just took the outside. Uh, pressure and he put it in a large bottle so you had the, the pressure but not the, the differential from the wind. Mm -hmm. He should split it and run it to the wire side of the... Oh, I see what you mean. The, the lee side and the... And yeah. then he also should run it along and then he should do the air density adjustment as well. But it should not change it a lot, but it might work in your favor. Okay. I'll talk to him about that for the next one. Um, the house is really comfortable. It is amazing how... Uh, yesterday, they, they blew, I didn't say this yet, they blew another 12 inches of cellulose in the roof. So I've got 24 inches. And the guy was like, you're crazy. What are you doing? Like, this is the warmest house in Vermont. I said, I'm hoping it is. <laughs> Hello. Um, so uh, it was very windy one morning, uh, Monday morning. When I did my 24 inches uh, of cellulose, the guy said, oh, another one of those 24 inches. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's great that he's hearing that. What a crazy guy. Um, we usually, when before the air sealing was done, when it was windy out, the doors in the house that were partially ajar would open and close. No more. No more. We don't hear the wind outside. We used to hear the wind coming through the house. No more. It's really quiet. It's really warm. I don't have a heating system. It was... The last week has been really cold since about Saturday. It hasn't really gotten above 60 degrees. The house is still 66 degrees. It hasn't changed in temperature for the entire week. It's beautiful. No, no, that's that's the next bit here, right? No, pro if I'm running the heat pump, I probably won't. I probably won't. And I, I had a half in here, but... I, I don't, I, I'm a conservative on that kind of thing. I like to overestimate things like that. We're putting a monitoring system in here. We're going to have an e-monitor in here. So I didn't put that in the pricing. I'm, I'm, I, that's added on top somewhere. But I'm putting an e-monitor in, and we're going to be monitoring indoor air quality. We're going to be monitoring temperature in all the rooms. We're going to be monitoring the efficiency of the HRV, efficiency of the heat pump. And um, and I'm really excited about that. It's going to be just for ambient, but it's going to heat so much in the house. When, before the house was was uh, done, the temperature in the north room where the fireplace is, where the wood stove is, was sometimes 86 degrees. And if that 86 degrees that's redistributed around the house, mm -hmm. I'm, I can turn my heat pump off. And I've got 10 acres of land. I get my own wood. That's free, except for my labor. So that's really exciting. So let's, I just want to go back to what is happening here. 99% of our houses are already built. When we build new houses, that's less than 1% of our houses. The biggest savings, that, you know, Malcolm and I were on the energy uh, 
the Thermal Energy Task Force, and we all know this as energy people, the biggest savings is in our existing stock, but it's also the most expensive fix. It costs approximately 30% of a house to do a deep energy re retrofit, never mind trying to hit the interfit. Vermont is a, a climate six, uh, zone six, cold and humid with 7,200 heat and degree, degree days. And it's very challenging to build and retrofit homes here. This is not Adam Cohen down in Virginia saying I can build a passive house for the same price as it costs to make a regular house. I wish I had his problems, <laughs> but I don't want to live in Virginia. Um, Nothing personal. I've been in Virginia. I like Virginia. People in Virginia, I like you, but I like it cold. I'm a cold weather person. I lived in Vermont. I lived in the Netherlands. I went not to Ibiza for vacation. I went to Scotland. Because I like it cold. You have said you were going to be, you didn't put the expense of your monitoring, but won't, because this is a high performance home, won't yeah. Efficiency Vermont give you the monitoring system? Isn't that part of their. I their, am their in, field? I am in the pipeline of being one of the monitored houses for the new air to air heat pump initiative. However, if you talk to the very competent people doing that project, they're still in setup, and they really don't know what's happening. Malcolm called me three months ago and said, this is happening, this is happening, you got to call right away. And I called right away, and it took me probably two hours of calling this person and calling that person to find the person I'm supposed to talk to. And then, I, well, what I did is I, I he told me Green Mountain Power. I called Kirk Shields Green Mountain Power. He gave me one person's name and then changed to another person. It's Carol Weston now, and I, I should. But the, the program is just to install an energy pump or what? This is because I, I, I need to install an energy pump here. Yeah, it's got to be in the the uh, what used to be uh, Central Vermont uh, Service and Power. So you ha it's it's the seed area they're calling it. So if you were taken over by Green Mountain Power in the past year, those are the people that are available. I am with, I am with Green but no, were, where were you with Central yeah. Vermont? Uh, no, so that's the difference. It's a really weird. It's mostly the southern tier, but there's some around uh, uh, Lamont, Saint Jay, and there's there. some around some around Lamont. Really, see, it gets a little yeah, network up in there. Yeah. Like this, you know, so I'm going to put in a e monitor. I said that um, we're going to try to see if my modeling matches the the, the reality. Uh, I'm going to put my pennies away to replace the windows at some point. I'm looking into uh, putting in a solar hot water system, a ground mounted hot water system that I'll probably install myself, and a condensing dryer. And this is what the house looks like after I put the siding back up. Yeah? Uh, I have two questions. Uh, first, uh, the, 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 did you run a uh, payback no. analysis no. on your investment? Business? No, I'm not. I am I I can and I will at some point I don't care I'm not doing this for payback although payback is interesting to a client so it's an, it's something that I do have to do at some point I haven't done it yet because I'm doing this for for all of the reasons that aren't payback also you should do a return of investment to throw payback away yeah, yeah. and second when you're talking about the domestic water system yeah how are you going to deal with it <clears throat> I'm going to have to make a new penetration. But I've got to be able to make new penetrations. It's got to be something I can do. You can just take your siding off and attach it to the roof. Yeah. yeah. And so mm -hmm. If you do that SDHW yourself, you will get the state incentive, right? Like just get the federal. Yeah. And, but uh, like I said, I, I can do plumbing. I'm an engineer. Plumbing is a no brainer. I, I don't have a problem in losing. It's the difference yeah, between I, I priced it out. A partner, part of the state, yeah. I, I asked a couple of. I know partners, so I probably get some of the off there. Oh, there you go. I, I've got. Wouldn't be wrong. I called three different people, and I got three different estimates on what it would cost to have the system installed, and they were around twelve thousand dollars. And I can buy all the equipment for about four. Yeah. Uh, I, I'd love to pay someone, have tons of money to pay someone you know, the extra $7,000 to do it for me, but I just, I don't see the, the the benefit added to that just because I know what I'm doing. If I didn't know what I was doing, then I understand it. 
So here's, um, I've been blogging about this the whole time uh, at my, my business's website, www.echohousesofvermont.com, uh, bt.com. And my wife wanted a greenhouse, so we got dark green siding. It took us about a week to all decide whether it was light green or dark green or whatever, but I ended up with light green siding. Um, and it, it looks blue because of the sun and because of the sky, but it's a dark green. Here it looks green. Yeah, my, we were in the woods the other day and it looks blue. Yeah, odd. It, it ended up that the saturation of the siding looked different when it got there than it did in the in the sample book. <clears throat> now, I'd just like to take a quick moment to say thank you to Jim Caleb, uh, uh, Jim Bradley. I'm always saying that, Jim Caleb, Jim Bradley of Caleb Construction, because he really did ride everybody on this. When the siding guys came and they wanted to use inch and a half nails, he said, no, I want you to use three quarter inch nails because I don't want you puncturing this. They couldn't find three quarter inch nails, so they went seven eighths. But with the thickness of the siding, that's about the same difference. So they weren't putting holes into the into the these. I mean, he was like he was like a father about that air barrier. It was awesome. Um, I would recommend Jim Caleb for any retrofit project. It's his main business. He does uh, you know energy work on houses. And I've never met a more conscientious guy who won't lie to you about what it costs and won't glad hand you. The people who did the siding on this, I ran into them at the uh, Home and Garden Show, and they were just like, oh, no, 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 it'll be fine. I was like, no, you don't. Know. No, 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 it'll be fine. Jim had a conversation with the guy. We'll never hire the guy again. The guy ended up really being trouble. And... All, all season vinyl siding, and I would not normally want to speak poorly of someone. The job they did was mediocre, in my opinion. The detailing was okay. He was like, "I've never seen a better job done." And I'm like, "Look, I'm not. I, first of all, if I was someone who didn't know better, why are you treating me like this? And second of all." I am someone who knows better and treat me like an intelligent person. I, I'd hate to think if I was some 60-year-old woman having to talk to this guy, what a line of BS she'd, he'd get and what kind of, of job they'd end up with. It just hurts my feelings. And that was it. So uh, I don't know how many people we might still have on. Oh, thank you. The attendees are still here. Sorry for being so verbose. Um, I will now uh, look at the questions section. If you guys have any questions you'd like to ask the, the, the attendees online, I can also go to the chat section, I guess. No? Well, I'm going to uh, move on then. Thank you so much for watching. And again, I'm sorry that I didn't end up making Interfit, but, you know, the numbers don't lie. You know, orientation, the right windows, and good thermal, uh, thermal breaks under your slab are really critical to getting there. The reason Chris Corson's house made it is because he, he, he didn't include his basement in the thermal envelope. He's doing from the joist down. I can't do that. I'd be living in half of my house if I did that. So, um, and he put his he put his windows in. So, um, those things really matter. Thanks again for attending. Yep. Yeah. Oh, do you have a question? Uh, yes, I was just wondering if there's anything that you would do differently. Having I'd have a happy accident. I'd let my house burn down and rebuild it. <laughs> um, um, what would I do differently? If I would do anything differently, I would have taken my past house course a month earlier and gotten the right windows. Um, but I've, I've been very meticulous and methodical with everything I've done, and um, I don't think that I would change anything. I think I'm happy with the way things are going. Um, I wish I had more money to, to, yeah, to hire someone to do the rest of the finish work. Um, I don't. Um, I no, I, I that's a good question, but I really don't. I really think I, I I've been very happy with how this went. Um, 
uh, another another three inches of insulation on the outside, bringing my R value up to R seven eighty or something. That would have gotten me closer to Enerfit. Um, but I'm afraid I'm afraid that you know it's one of those moments where it is what it is, and there's only so much you can do with that orientation and being in the middle of the woods. Um, where did you get your I, it's actually, um, it's in the presentation, and I'll put this presentation on the website. Um, the Insulation Depot is the name of the, of the warehouse there in Framingham, but they don't always have what you need. They're about the same distance as this other guy was. Um, and he, that was um, Hickory Street, um, there, Hickory Street Rentals in Anianza, New York. John uh, Gonzalez, and I have his contact information if you want to know. I'd be happy to give you his email, and um, you can get in touch with him. Um, Jeff from Insulation Depot told me that he had what I needed. How much was it for the Oh boy, uh, it was. Uh, I think it we. It was twelve dollars a foot for the e, for, for a four by eight sheet for the EPS, wow. and it was twenty for a three inch thick, and it was twenty one dollars for the um, poly ISO. I had a builder who but yeah. we used uh, polyacid as well, and he was lucky enough that he didn't have any holes in it because it came from a commercial building from the after the insulation. Yeah. So that must be really lucky. Yeah. No penetration there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The, uh, so you went and picked it up? No, he delivered it. That was the $500 delivery the fee. The insulations are not the critical, because you were still coming. I mean, well, you need the ceilings. Yeah, yeah, it was, it was a couple of cans of, yeah. of uh, one part mm -hmm. foam. Nobody, the, the membrane outside. Oh, I have a question. Why does it do that? See, I can't read the question. It's like stuck up there. What would you estimate the results would have been facing south? Yeah, that's something I have to do, Bill. I need to take the, um, the PHPP and just rotate everything and see what it would have been. The problem is I have as many windows on the north as I do on the south. So if I were to make it a uh, an inner fit, I'd have to get rid of a lot of my north-facing windows because north-facing windows are straight losses. So if I had my large bay window and a bunch of nice big windows on the south face, I'd have to get rid of almost all of my north face windows or bring them down to those little, you know, one and a half by one and a half windows that just give you a view but don't don't aren't really windows in the sense of ports like on a on a on a ship. Which wood stove did I? Oh, I installed a um, Hearthstone. That's the um, that's the the wood stove that I that I installed. Yeah. What would have happened if you did interior storms with that for you? I, I had that would increase my um, uh, my air ceiling, so I might get a better air ceiling number, and I might be able to increase the R value on the uh, on the window itself. Mm -hmm. yeah. But and, and originally I had priced originally doing that, but that was astronomical. Um, okay, I'd love to hear it. I'm still talking, you know, fifty hundred dollars a window. Plus the hardware and I think I can get for around a thousand. For the whole yeah. Okay. But these are double, double layer film. Okay. You know, not acrylic. Right. They're a glass. Hmm? The glass. No, it's double film. Oh, okay. Okay. So. So it's a plastic film. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That I. I'm going to see how this. Uh, I certainly like to talk about it, but I'm, I'm going to leave the house like this for us see how it operates. Okay. Thank you very much. I'm going to stop the presentation. Thank you. Oh, what? Uh, one more question. What's the life expectancy of the Mento 1000 material? Um, I think it's guaranteed for 30 years. You have to check with Ken. Um, the big problem with that is the UV, is that you can't leave it exposed for more than three months, otherwise it starts degrading. So I had, uh, it was put in at the end of January, and I had this installed at the end of April. So I was, in, I was within two months. And, and that was, uh, but if you contact Ken Levinson at 475 Building Supply, he'll tell you what the... They also have a variation of that that is the book in the PDP. Yeah. Solitex. Yeah, Solitex. So there are, but it is more expensive. And we did go with the Mento 1000 instead of uh, other products and the Intello inside just because of workability. There's a paper product that Steve Spatz had used inside that he, he, he found hard to work with. Mm -hmm. so.
the reason to put the Intel on inside the ones you say just Six any years. experiment? Sixty years. There you go. Yeah. Thank you, Sandra. Sandra pulled that right up. Um, the reason for going on the with the inside is to see if it makes a difference on the blower door test, it and uh, well, it's not all installed yet. Um, but when it is, we'll do that. And um, uh, once the the uh, the blower door test uh, is done and all of it's installed, we'll see if it has an effect. You haven't finalized the air sealant yet. Well, the 4.25 number that we got is the number we're going with until I finish the, the basement renovation part, which I'm, I'm hoping will be uh, sometime in July. Because I'm doing it on my own. It's, I'm just, so you may reduce it to... I'm, I'm definitely going to get down below 400 when I seal that chimney up. I'm definitely going to get that. So you, you may get to 188. Oh, I'd love to get to 188. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think, I, this point is 2 ACH. I'm at 2 ACH. And if I pull that 40 out, I'm at like, you know, 1.9 or... 1.85. I don't. I don't think I'm going to make it to 1 ACH with this house. I just don't think that it's in there. There was. There is a, a point where the slab meets the the cement wall where there is a little gap, and I am going to be caulking that with something called Geo Seal, yeah. um, which is which stays pliable. And I may get 10 or 20 ACH. Uh, you know, uh, CFM out of that. Who knows? You know, I'm, I'm happy for anything. Jim's, uh, Jim and I are partnering up in, in other ways, so he'll probably give me a good deal on uh, extra blow tests. <laughs> what was that that standard you were saying you were hoping to achieve? Um, what was that standard? Uh, the Enerfit. Enerfit is the passive house retrofit standard. And that is one ACH. That's one ACH, seven point seven five kilobit hues per square foot per year, um, and then uh, similar cooling, and I think it's the thirty eight kilobit hues per square foot per year for CO2 output, but for primary energy use. But it is less strict than the new house, but it's not quite, it's just a little under double. Okay. Yeah. And at this point, how many energy use per square foot? Oh, you want me to do that calculation? Okay. Um, it's uh, 2,088 square feet uh, and 21,000 BTUs. Ten. Using that calculation, on uh, from the passive house planning package, it's twenty-four, which is three times the benefit. Little, little, uh, just around three times. Twenty-four kilobits used per square foot per year. Why ten and twenty-four? Because you asked for BTU per square foot, and um, this is kilobits used per square foot per, t per year. Yeah. That's all. Okay, I'm going to stop the recording right now. Thank you very much. Oh, one more. Yes. Oh, I, another question. Oh, thank you. Have you considered ser serve instead of an HRV and heat pump? I was at the presentation for the serve, and no, I didn't. What I would consider was uh, the magic box, if they had a magic box. Um, but... After watching the presentation on the CERB, I was underimpressed with a number of different aspects of it. Um, the efficiency on the HRV side, uh, and uh, I, I don't remember exactly my reservations. I'd have to go back and look at the presentation again. But when I when I was in the presentation, I thought, "Huh, you know, no, I'm not I'm not going to go with this." Right now, uh, uh, the the split. It was also expensive, if I remember correctly. The, the mini split and the HRV are ten thousand dollars plus installation, and that's a good number for me. I, I mean, I'm happy with that. And it's two companies that I know, and uh, not just some some guy and his dad out in a garage in in uh, Illinois, which I don't have a problem with, <laughs> but I don't want to rely on that. Um, I certainly would use their indoor air quality monitors, that mailbag thing. I thought that was great, $90, and they do the whole test for you. That's awesome. But um, but not not for me, not, not at this point. Are those alternatives to the Mitsubishi type of heat? Well, it's, it's a, a mixture of a heat pump and a ventilation system. But there there were specifics about it that made me think, no, I don't want to do this. And I don't. Yeah, it's inside. 
And what is the magic box? The magic box is a is a, uh, a German creation for passive houses, which is an HRV that's attached to a heat pump. So you take the last once your HRV takes the heat from your indoor air and puts it into the fresh outdoor air that's coming in. There's still a couple of degrees of energy in there, and it goes right into the heat pump and uses that to heat your hot water. So before you pump out, because your your HRV is 85 to 90 percent efficient, there's still 10 percent, 15 percent in there. The heat pump can use that heat to to make hot water with, and that's what it does. Um, although we're having problems getting them imported here. The, the Nilan was about 12, but they refused to. <laughs> they stopped importing them. Okay, we're at, we're at 11 o'clock. Thank you all very much for coming and. Um, the presentation will, will be available online and the recording as well. Thank you very much.